is is Comet Elenin, which is this is a serious thing, and it's doing serious harm. There are no question in my mind. But is it being used to mask something else? Worse yet, uh, if it comes and goes, all right. And everybody then starts saying, "Well, hallelujah! You know, we uh, we survived Planet X. It's never coming back again, and we're not going to give a moment's thought about it." And then all of a sudden, the years later, we're in some serious deep guacamole. But Ed, what's your take on it? Um, there are so many uh, irregularities about this whole comet. Um, even with the name of the uh, ex- uh, the gentleman that discovered it, um, mm-hmm. down to uh, we really didn't think much about this comet until, um, at least ways myself, until this uh, letter came out supposedly that was from the uh, Russian defense minister to the uh, Russian president about this comet. Mm-hmm. And uh, saying that they're going to have to uh, get busy digging some more underground facilities and uh, preparing. And they also mention um, that this comet appeared to be under intelligent control. And mm-hmm. uh, I believe we've been watching it sort of get steered through the asteroid belt. And um, also that uh, there's a brown dwarf behind it. <clears throat> or a plan I should say a planet. Uh, the brown dwarf uh, part is uh, Terrell's end of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's it's something where when it comes inside the orbit of Jupiter, and in our book Planet X Forecast and 2012 Survival Guide, would, uh, we believed at that time, Jacko Vanderwerp, uh, is that uh, this thing would light up. It's going to get close enough to have electrical interactions, and we're going to see it. Now, that being said, I mean, the official line is that, what, late summer we may be able to get up to pre-dawn hours and, with you know, see it with the naked eye. Uh, But um, then again, there's a lot of that other stuff, and I know that the comet being under control, uh, last I saw, that was uh, sorts of foul. Is there anyone else saying it's under intelligent control besides Sor Chafel? I know the anybody? story originated with Sorcha. Okay. All right. And uh, by the way, Richard, uh, I've got in the virtual chat room that uh, our listeners are having a hard time hearing you, so if you could find a way to increase your volume, that would be real helpful. Okay. All right. Well, then, <clears throat> let's do this, guys. Let's start breaking this thing down and compartmentalizing it so we can just look at it logically because uh, there's it just to me it, it's like getting a big picture puzzle you know tossed out of the box and the corner pieces are missing you know it's like it's just heck for dickens to try and put a picture puzzle together without the corner pieces and that's where we're at with this thing so I would say the first thing is uh, what is the object, and I want to go with each of you, and you make your case for what you think this object is. You've already mentioned it before, but let, let's let's get this organized. So I'm going to start off with Richard. Yeah. What's your thinking? Uh, like I said, I think it's just a comment, but from some of the analysis that I've done from Amateur astronomers, uh, Gustavo was one of them, he's mm-hmm. been us, and he's been taking some great pictures of it. And, of course, I got interested in uh, Planet X about a year ago. And mm-hmm. six months later, after I've been on the uh, Planet X Town Hall uh, chat room, uh, well, Common Ellen was, was discovered. Well, that piqued mm-hmm. my curiosity, and I followed it. And about two or three months ago, I really began looking at some of these photographs myself. And I go to whatever website I could find to get uh, amateur uh, astronomers' pictures, and I'd enhance them on, on my own. And like I say, I think it's just a comet, 
and it looks like a common in pictures. But when you mm-hmm. take some of the analysis of, of the length of the tail and the le- and the width of the coma, they say the coma is one arc minute uh, in diameter. Mm-hmm. And arc minute will change by distance. So uh, two months from now, if they say it's an arc minute, it will not be the same figure in my understanding. But at the time of the pictures were taken that I looked at, the coma was 80,000 miles. Mm-hmm. Well, I started looking at some of the enhanced photos, and I could see uh, what I think is a nucleus. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. And some of the pictures I looked at, they would have a graph at the top, and sure enough, it's segmented into 60 segments. All right. So I look at the nucleus, and I say, okay, well, that's three segments. Uh, one segment's 9,000 miles. <laughs> so if I see a nucleus that shows up as three segments, three times nine is 27,000 miles across. Well, that doesn't, mm-hmm. that's not what the kind of information I'm getting from official sources. And even now, how does it compare? A, What's the official sources saying? Uh, well, four, four miles across is mm-hmm. a nucleus. Right. So, and I'm not saying that what I'm saying is it is actually 27,000 miles across. I'm just saying that from what I see in the enhanced photos, I got a conflicting thought there. You know, it's a comet, but yet, what am I seeing here? Yeah, so, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I mean, this thing is just connecting the dots. Here is pretty tough and let me just take a moment to tell the folks in the virtual studio i mean it's uh the virtual studio is just on fire i can't even scroll down far enough to see the list of everyone logged on and uh so i'm going to be watching in the virtual panel so right now if somebody has a question for richard put it in there and uh i'll be sure to get to it but you gotta go fast could i follow that up uh marshall Mm-hmm. Uh, Please do. Okay. Well, we came across a link that is a technical paper by a scientist that submitted a paper to the European Royal Society. This guy's not playing around, okay? He's right. submitting the paper to his peers to analyze and and to pass for publication. And when I saw that 27,000-mile diameter, I just blew it off and said, well, I'm just seeing things. I'm, trying, I'm looking for that paper now. Here it is. Uh, well, while you're looking for that, i got a in the virtual studio, the user Kurto has said it is not a comet nor just a comet, which, again, we already know it is not alone. How many comets do you know of have a tail that is 900,000 kilometers uh, 560,000 miles long at least. Oh, uh, plenty. It's not know, unique. It's not unique. No. Uh, All right. Even a close encountering comet like uh, Elenin is at, uh, what, 0.232 uh, AU. Uh, I'll post a link in a minute that gives a list of about 15 different comets that have come way closer than that. So even that's okay. not unique. There are some unique things I do want to bring out tonight. All right, we're going to then we're going to do that. I have a question here, and I'm going to throw it to Terrell um, because I know Terrell was doing this. Uh, we got one fellow. What about Gustavo's pics that show other objects swirling about this thing? I mean, the objects that are the satellites orbiting this thing are really a hot button topic right now in the virtual studio. I'm going to throw that at Terrell. Okay. Uh, what we're looking at is a high-density dwarf star that no one can see. But they can mm-hmm. see the orbitals that pass in and out of the proton cloud that is shrouding this thing. So you have one person going out and seeing an orbital that's one of the moons, and they, oh, it's a small thing. Then they see the planet, oh, it's a big thing. So we're getting conflicting reports because they're seeing different objects orbiting in and out of the proton cloud. Okay. Well, what you should be asking right. is, 
If this thing is that big, how come we just can't see it? This is only 1.0 AU distance away. It's only 180 million miles. And if it's that big, why can't we see it? If we cannot see it, it must fall in the category of just a few things. One is the door star, a black star, which is theoretical, or a black hole. There's only so many things this can be to be so close and we can't see it. And it's not a comet because it has too much mass. The paper you're talking about is astronomical alignments as the cause of um, magnitude 6 seismicity by Mensor Omer Bashik from the European Royal Society. He dated mm -hmm. alignments back to 1965. This thing has been affecting our planet since 1965 with alignments and major earthquakes, 6 plus. The only way it can do that is if it has great mass. And the only, it's 1.8 AU away, so it has to be only a certain number of things to be that close and that massive. And one of them is a brown dwarf star. Well, you know that, uh, and I see a question here uh, from Papa Bear One. Are we talking about the same thing visible in the South Pole? And again, he goes, what now is uh, considered Nibiru coming in from the South during sunrise and sunset? And, of course, that question caught my attention because I'm the guy that broke the story on the South Pole Telescope back in, I think it was 2006. And uh, and it was quite incidental. It was a very incidental thing. But uh, I think it's a very pointed question, and I'm going to ask each of you guys to answer that question. Do you think that this is the object that has been under observation by the South Pole Telescope? I'll go now first. start. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. But being at the South Pole has nothing to do with this. O this object is coming out of Leo. South of the ecliptic just means the lower part of Leo. It doesn't have to be on the South Pole. It's not like it's coming up from straight under the Earth. It's it's coming out of Leo. That, you know that we can see. It's in it's in clear space. The difference between north and southern hemisphere, or north and south of the ecliptic, is is that right at the belt of Orion running across Leo. It's not like it's going to be difficult to see because it's in the southern hemisphere. I think a lot of people have that confused that in order to see something coming out of the southern hemisphere, you have to have a, a telescope on the South Pole. And I don't believe that's the case. I think it's easy to control the people that are at the South Pole and the information that's coming out of there. And that's why the, the telescope is there, not because they're seeing anything that's coming directly under the Earth or anything like that. Mm, well, that's an interesting point, because there's an awful lot of secrecy about the South Pole Telescope. I mean, you know, one of the things I always found interesting was I have a gentleman in New Zealand who follows and supports us, and uh, he runs a merchant network you know, for processing credit cards and banking and whatnot down there in New Zealand. I sure hope he didn't get, uh, I haven't heard from him since the uh, Christchurch quake. And he said that there was a lot of researchers that were going in and buying their provisions and supplies and whatnot, because it's uh, New Zealand's a stop-off point for a lot of the science teams. And they were really getting annoyed with the South Pole Telescope. They were saying that uh, special C-130s on direct flights with apparently mid-air refueling, were coming in from the United States directly to Scott Edmondson Landing, and these teams would get off, go to the South Pole Telescope for two weeks, not talk to anybody, and then just leave, which is really contrary to the scientific open culture of the Scott Edmondson Station. So, yeah, maybe it just was a place where they could keep it pretty quiet, though, uh, uh, you know, I'll, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. Um, Tara, what's your th 